Okay, so here's the thing I've neglected for too long. This camera, the Wood Sum camera, this, this is a wooden camera that came as a kit that I tested just before Christmas. I tested the assembly just before Christmas and I said I was going to come back and try it with a film because indeed it is a functioning pinhole camera. And I never got around to doing that. So let's do that today. Okay, so one thing's a little bit interesting is that the shutter is a bit sticky. And I don't know whether that's just where it's been kept in a place that's a tiny bit too humid, maybe. But we are going to have to try to free that up before we can go and test this. You can see the pinhole inside that little cavity there. But we're going to be using this on a tripod anyway, so even if I can't free up that shutter, I can always just press that down and then carefully pull it back up. One thing conspicuous to note is nowhere in these instructions does it tell me how to load the film. I think it must have to be very intuitive. I guess we'll find out, won't we? So that back panel comes off, that other panel comes off, and then we've got this little piece here which slots in down there. And I believe 35 millimeter film winds onto that spool somehow. I think we just catch it in the end or something like that. And then we wind on that way. But the other thing is, it is also, I don't know how many times you have to wind it to get one frame. So it doesn't tell us that either. So this is all going to be a bit of an experiment. Well, it's been a long time since I opened one of these. But there we go, we've got a Kodak, Kodak Ultramax 400 film. How about that? I haven't seen this in a while. So we slot the film canister in there, I presume. Maybe that piece comes up and out, I don't know. Okay, then that piece and that piece and that. And then that little bit in mean, there goes in last. And then I think we have to Okay, that's going to wind on, that's good. Let's get the film retainer in there. That piece on, that piece on. Now the, the interestingly sort of zigzag overlapping design of all of these different little pieces, in theory, means that light is excluded. In practice, however, we just don't know. So I'm going to assume that one full turn of this is one frame of the film. I think that seems reasonable. Keep that little canister because you don't get many of those these days, but they always used to be very useful for all sorts of things. So let's take this camera out and see if we can take some shots with it. Okay, so this is our first location. Just going to try and get a shot of the village square here. <laughs> Okay, so that was the field test. Let's get that film out of there. I've already wound it back. Now, as I was winding it back, I could see the spool turning, so I am reasonably confident that the film has wound back inside its little canister. But this is the point where it could all go horribly wrong. If it hasn't wound back, I could overexpose the entire film. Let's have a look. No, we're good. It's wound back into the canister. Now we've just got to get that film out of there. Not as easy as I thought. Yeah, that's what, that's how you meant to do that bit. That whole spindle comes out and goes back in and fixes thusly. So yeah, that whole spindle unit comes out there. So 
Critique so far of this is it could do with instructions on how to load the film. It is relatively intuitive if you've loaded a 35mm camera before, but if you haven't, you have to figure it out. So it could do with instructions on that, and it could do with instructions on how many turns here represents a full frame of film. I have no idea whether the pictures I've taken today are going to be overlapping frames or whether they're going to be spaced apart and so on. This is supposedly a 36 exposure film, but I didn't get 36 out of it. I got, I think, probably about 20. So I suspect I have spaced them out too far on the roll, but we'll see anyway. I'm going to go take these to the store now and get them developed, and then we'll come back and see what we got. Okay, it's time to review the photos that came back from the lab from this camera. Now this was an interesting experience because it used to be that you had to wait a week for photos and then in the sort of 80s and 90s and early 2000s you could get one hour photo processing everywhere in the world and now we've gone back to having to wait a week again. And so I sent my film off, took it into the shoe repair place of all places, took it into Timpsons and had my photos developed and they've come back today. So let's have a look and see what we've got. So my negatives and an index print, which is like an old fashioned contact sheet. It does show me I've got some images here. So there's hope that we've got some decent photos. Let's have a look. So yeah, not a keeper. Now that one's interesting. Got a certain retro overexposed charm to it. So that's the view of the high street and we've got a car blurring through the shot there. Another one there with a bit too much light leakage on it. And then we start to get half decent photos here. Now I think this is probably just where I've had trouble winding it on. So we've got a little bit of a high street there. The Market Hall. Now that's the first, I would say, quite decent photo actually. You know, considering this is just a bit of fun, this kit was just really a bit of hobby fun to assemble. We've actually managed to take a photograph with it. How about that? Another one there, a little bit of light leakage on the edge there. Interesting. And another one there where I've only managed to wind it on halfway by the look of it. And then, oh, actually, I wonder if that's, no, that's not, that's not part of that one. Well, it might be. Oh, uh, yeah, it could be. Anyway. And then down at the mill. That actually is not a bad photo, I think. It's a little bit blurry, but that's a, probably the best we're going to get using using this camera. I mean, it's a pinhole camera. It is just a bit of fun. Another photo of the mill there. Now, the reason I've got duplicates of these photos is obviously that they recommended that you use exposure bracketing. And so while I was taking these, I was doing one exposure where I went, went for about three seconds and then winding on, doing another one where I went for about five seconds and then close and then winding on and then another one when I went for about 10 seconds doesn't seem to have actually made very much difference to the exposure. I think probably because modern film is very, very tolerant to a wide range of different exposure conditions. So anyway, yeah, not a bad picture of the mill. I will scan these all in and we'll do a little slideshow at the end of the video. And then another one where I've had trouble winding, I think. Although that, again, that and that, I think, are part of the same frame. And then the other side of the mill with the water there. And again, not bad photos and a weird overexposed grey one. I imagine this is probably the frame that was in the film. Well, that's right at the end. Yeah, I don't know. Don't know why that's overexposed like that. Maybe it was very, very underexposed and the developing process has tried to compensate for that and ended up with nonsense. So anyway, let's pick out what we think are decent photos out of this lot. So we've got a couple of decent ones there. Again, a couple of other decent ones of the mill there, of the, the boathouse rather, not the mill. Oh, that's not bad. That's not bad. And all these weird ones here, I'm going to say that one is probably Instagrammable. Maybe that one as well. So that's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, we've actually, we assembled a camera from scratch from a kit. We took it out, we took some photos, and we ended up with some actually recognisable photos. I'm pretty pleased with that, really. The quality is nowhere near as good as you'd get from a digital camera or even a vintage 35mm camera, but that is not the point. The point is we had a bit of fun 
and we made a camera. And that's something you can't always do. So let's put the photos aside actually and have a look at the negatives because that will tell us about something that happened in this camera. So when we look at the negs here, and we'll just look at them on a sheet of white paper here, we can see that the film is obviously exposed. That's the leader bit that, that was sticking out of the camera while I loaded it. Then we've got frames of pictures all the way down to there. And then we've got a whole load of unused film. Now, that does highlight a slight problem I had with this camera. And it could have just been me, and it could have been the way I loaded the film. But I found that I didn't really know how far to wind this to advance one frame. And so I was assuming that it's just one full rotation of that would wind it on one frame. So I, I kind of lost track of how much film I was moving through here. And so after I'd taken about, well, those 16 photos, I really had no idea how much film I had adv advanced through the camera. And so I got to a point where I tried to wind it on and it seemed like both of these spools were jammed. And I assumed that was the end of the film. So I wound it back, sent it off for development. It looks like I've only actually used about half of the available film. And I don't know what the reason for that is. It may be that there's insufficient slack or space on this take-up spool here to wind on a full film. So it might be that that got too fat with the film wound around it and jammed there. It may just be that something jammed in the actual canister or the film itself and it didn't let me wind the film out of the canister. It could just be something as simple as that. But we'll, um, we, we'll maybe have another go with another film in one of my random weekend videos and see if that's a problem with the camera or if it's just a one-off freakish event. So let's sum up impressions of the Woodsum Pinhole 35mm camera. Positives. It was a heck of a lot of fun to build. I really, really enjoyed putting this kit together and the parts are very, very precisely engineered using very high quality materials. I was just constantly impressed with the way it all fit together and there was no, didn't need any coercing to make those parts fit. I just was really pleased with the whole way the kit went together in general and so that was really good. So it's a lot of fun also as a concept, just the idea that you can put together a functional camera and then take it out and take real pictures with it is a rare opportunity I would say and it's a nice little bit of sciencey project you could do with children or young adults and they would get something out of that and have a bit of fun. It's quite good value for money, I think, considering the quality of the materials involved and the quality of the finished object. So that's all the pros. Couple of tiny little cons then. So one is that the shutter mechanism just was a little bit sticky. And so I had to have that on a tripod and to push the shutter down. And then when I was ready, pull it back up again. The shutter actually doesn't seem to completely exclude all of the light. There's a tiny little hole there that's still actually letting light in. And I think that is responsible for some of these partial light leakages that we saw. Let me see if I can find one, maybe there. I think that's why we've got a little bit of light leakage here and there on some of the photos. It doesn't really matter though, because I think sometimes on a retro photo like this, a little bit of that light leakage gives it an effect all of its own. So the other thing is that there was just a weird thing about this. There were two of these supplied in the kit and I couldn't figure out where they both go. That one seems to fit on there, but only loosely. And I couldn't really figure out what you're meant to do with the other one, unless it's a spare, in case you lose one. But anyway, tiny little problem. And the only other thing as well, as I say, is there were no clear instructions on how to load the film. I just had to figure that out for myself. And there, were, there was no indication of how far I have to wind that to advance one frame. So I had to guess. Those are tiny little things. They could just add a document on their website or an FAQ or something like that, and they can just improve that. I will feed that information back to them and hopefully they will update the website and maybe they'll ship out a little information slip with the things. So all in all, I'm really pleased with this kit. It's by far the best laser cut kit I've ever assembled, and I have done a few. And I think it's really something to be able to go out and build a camera and then take it out and come back with some photos that look kind of okay. So I'll do a slideshow, as I say, of all these photos at the end of this video. So should you buy this? I think I'd recommend it. I'll put links in the video description. They're not affiliate links. This was a free sample that was given to me for the purposes of review, but I don't make any money if you click through and buy. So I hope you realize that means my recommendation to buy this is not based on any profit motive of mine. It's just because I think this is a lot of fun. It's fun to put together. It's fun to use. And it's great, really, 
to get the results of your labour back in the form of photographs. So this was a lot of fun and yes, I recommend it. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon. Here comes that slideshow. Music